What is an O331 machine gunner in the Marine Corps? Well, today we're going to find out. We've got Lance Corporal Sims. Lance Corporal Sims. I appreciate you sitting down and taking the time to chat with us today. Uh, yeah, I think it's important people understand what, what all the different MOSs are in the Marine Corps, and I, I wanted to start off with the infantry, and I think that um, getting a firsthand perspective from people that actually do the job is huge because what better way to get firsthand experience and perspective of a job other than from somebody who actually does it for a living, you know? Uh, so again, I appreciate you taking the time, Sims. Um, I know you guys, this is like, this is Saturday, by the way. So like they're taking their liberty to take the time to, to do this with us. So I appreciate you guys doing that. I know li Libbo is important to me. I'm a Libbo hound, just like everybody else, you know what I'm saying? So I appreciate you guys taking the time. But uh, so Sims, where are you from? I am originally from Jamaica. Jamaica? Uh, yes. No joke. I was born in Jamaica. I came okay. in Jamaica. And I'm I'm uh from New York now. I live in New York. Okay, New York. When did you when did you move to the States from Jamaica? Uh roughly like about seven, eight years ago. Seven, eight years ago? Yeah. Okay. Did you so you were born in Jamaica? Did you get your citizenship here then? Yes, I did. Nice. Okay. Did you get it before or after you joined? It was uh after. After? Yes. That's dope. It's, that's an awesome yeah. that's a lot of people don't realize that you can do that. You can like enlist in the military. You, did you have to have your green card first? Yes, you do. Okay, see, that's that's the one thing. You got to get your green card. But once you got your green card, if you join the service, you can earn citizenship. And what a what a freaking stellar way to earn citizenship in the United oh, States. Phenomenal. That's yeah. awesome, man. I'm glad to hear that. That's good. I'm glad you you definitely earned it. You earned it more than I earned it, in my opinion. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like you 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 raised your right hand to support and defend the Constitution. So. Um, that's awesome, man. Glad to hear it. When did, when did you actually join the Marine Corps? I joined in August 9th, 2020. Okay. August 9th, 2020. And then you went through infantry training battalion in the fall. Yes. Okay. What, when did you go? What month? Uh, roughly November. November. Mm -hmm. So it's just starting to get cold probably. Yes. Okay. And you're, you're a machine gunner, right? I am a machine gunner. Okay, how do you feel about that? Uh, great, uh, best job in the Marine Corps. Best job in the Marine Corps? Oh, yes. Every machine gunner I know it always says that, but I, yes. I, I'm I, inclined to to believe them, regardless of my own feelings, because like, it's the best job that any of these guys will tell you is the best job I've ever had, any machine gunner I've ever met. So like, uh, I appreciate the passion that machine gunners have for that profession. I oh, do. yes, for sure. I appreciate that. I appreciate that passion. All right, so um, you went through... Infantry training battalion in August of 2020, you said, yes. right? It must have been weird because that was like during the lockdowns and stuff. It was. Did uh, you have to wear masks and everything yes. there? Yes, it was like Not COVID was a big deal. You had a, you were locked down for like days. Mm. Couldn't really go anywhere. <sighs> you no know libo? No. Oh, man. Was, that's, a, that's a tough time. It was a tough, real tough time, but. But you were there for eight weeks, yes. right? You see, and for 31s, you guys do the same thing as every other one as far as like the first four weeks or like the O three XX training. Um, you guys are going to like, you know, to the field to shoot table three, four, five, and six. And then you do like you guys shot two oh threes? Uh no. No, you didn't shoot two oh threes? How about an A T four? Did you guys shoot an A T four out of there? No? Mm -hmm. Did you guys shoot um what's it called? The uh Carl's Carl okay. Gustavs? No. No. Mm -hmm. Okay. We just, it was just strictly machine guns and M twenty sevens. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, once you get to the once you got to the split, what weapon systems did you guys use and get hands on as far as when you were split? Yeah, at the split. It's M two forty Bravo. Okay. M two A one, which is a fifty cal and a Mark nineteen. Okay, so you guys didn't mess with the saw yet, or no, didn't? We didn't have the saws. Okay. The saws were already gone. They already got rid of it. Man, that's a that makes me feel old right there. <laughs> they saw the saws when I was going through, but that's probably good. I mean, it's probably good. Like, you know, you guys are sticking with the three that you're actively using. Yes. You know. Um, what kind of things do you guys learn about those weapon systems? So you learn the max ranges, you learn like how to employ them, not really as much as you do when you get to the fleet. So in, uh, ITB it's just the basics, like how heavy they are, yeah. how to mount them on tripods okay. and how to disassemble and reassemble them. So it's not really as much, the science is not really applied as much okay. in, uh, ITB. That's when you get to the fleet and when you go to advanced school, that's when you learn like the real science. Yeah, so, which it is definitely a science, and partial it, part of it's an art, in it, 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 to a certain degree as well. Yeah, it's very artistic, man. Yes. Learning, learning the art of belt fedness. 
<laughs> um, yeah, so, a... all right. So you guys, did, did you, did you guys learn about like, um, like the, like mills and like, ch- like obviously like set it like left and right and like traversing and like the different types of fire, like different types yes. of fires and stuff like that. Yes. All of those, you learn those in ITB. Those are okay. like basic knowledge. Yeah. All the basic stuff. Yes. Um, so the way how it's set up is like, they give you like a rough breakdown of how all the weapon system work. You know, you go what each weapon system at a time. So you start off with the 240 yeah. and then you go to the 50 cal, then you go to the Mark 19 and you have a, like a rough breakdown of, hey, this is how this gun works and this is how you employ it. And then you go to the, the next and you just keep going. Yeah. You learn all the nomenclature of everything on the inside. Yeah. So that way you can understand. You get like a little booklet. It's not a little one. It's a really a thick pretty, one. pretty yeah. thick book. Yeah. yeah. And do you, you guys do a lot of disassembly and assembly. I mean, yes, that's right. Like, Hard on. Yeah, you like breaking know. it down a certain amount of time, putting it back together yeah, a certain amount of time. Minutes. You get three minutes for each weapon system. Three minutes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or that two forty is not two forty easy. 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 You, you can do it in sub one minute if you yeah. want. But the fifty cal, I don't know. So it, maybe it's different because the fifty. Now, were you were you guys using the new ones that have the uh, the notch the notch in the side, the one that have the preset headspace and timing? Yes. Okay. The preset. Yeah. That makes it a little bit easier, but not much. I know because there's less pe- the piece. What is it? The What is it that's fused together now that didn't used to be fused together? There's like some pieces of it on the inside. You know, Tamal. Fused together. Yeah, like uh, there's a part of the block on the inside that no longer breaks apart that used to before they upgraded it. I forget what it was. I can't remember, but. It's it's still a lot of teeny pieces, like those little springs and stuff like that. All the sear spring, all, all of that stuff is still there. So, the the difference between uh, the legacy and the the new M two A one is is just that on the legacy you were able to change the headspace and time it yeah. and fix it yourself. Before now, it's like you have to get an armor in order to change the headspace and time it. Yeah, and, that's kind of a bummer. I feel like because that was like a lost art. Now you know, like the don't the have to learn that anymore is kind of so. Yeah, that so. What my hope is is that the Marine Corps will realize, hey, uh, we can't afford to provide everybody with an armor in combat. Maybe we should start teaching the machine gunners how to do this again. Still learn it. You still learn it. Yes. So okay. the armor will come out, and he will check your headspace and time in for you. Yeah. And he will show you how to do it. So. Oh, he does. Okay. Yes. The only thing you just won't have the tool to do it. Okay. So you get a little tool in order to check your headspace and time in. My so, hope is that they'll get you one of them tools one of these days. That's, that would be a, that would you be know? good, but yeah, really hard to put your hands. We'll on. get there eventually. We're, <laughs> we're we'll work our way up to it. I hope we do get to that point because I mean, like that. All my seniors taught us how to do headspace and timing. And everybody had an H and T gauge in their damn cargo pocket. You know what I'm saying? Like everybody was doing that stuff. You in the field, on the fly, whatever you need to do. You know, um, because then it's like you can control. You're in real good control of your gun at that point because yes. like you can set you can you can set like how many like how long between each round going off that that it yeah. it goes like the 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 timing piece right, um, and then obviously headspace. Just that's gonna be. We, how about this? Explain what headspace is to people who so don't know. For your headspace is just the distance in between. Oh, I'll break it down as simple as I can. Okay. So when you have a round in the chamber, it's just the distance between your round in the chamber and the front of your bolt face. So okay. you have your round in the chamber and your front of the bolt face. That's just the distance in between that. Yeah. If it's if it's like too far apart, then uh, your uh, firing pin won't hit the round. And the round won't go off. It's just that right, simple. which will essentially result in misfires. Misfired. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Makes sense. Okay. Yeah, and, and now headspace. That's what that is. Timing. What is timing? Timing is just so in a fifty cal. It it's a recoil operated, short recoil operated weapon system. So yeah. it has to. It, it takes a specific amount of time to hit the um the back of the round. Yeah, and when it fires, it has to go back push back full uh the bolt has to go back forward and if the timing is off then when it goes back to hit the primer again it just won't de- uh hit the um, the cartridge and yeah. you won't fire it, it, it it's essentially the same thing but it's just cause misfires again yeah yeah because it needs to be like a specific yeah it needs that perfect so timing parts. yeah yeah because it's it's that recoil like you're saying it's recoil operated so the the 
the actual bolt face will recoil yeah. from the explosion of the last round yeah. and then come back to slap, slap. the next yeah. one. And if it doesn't happen exactly yeah. at the right time, then it starts, you have stuff get jammed up and it doesn't strike, the firing pin won't strike the... the... Yeah, the 50 cal is a real complex weapon system. So yeah. It will like, a, the slightest thing, it will make it misfire because there's so much moving parts inside of it. When? Cal. So how long have we been using the 50 cal for now? Oh... Uh, like since night, like the early 1900s, right? Or maybe even 1800s. I can't remember when Browning. So Browning was the first one. So, yeah, that's it's it's a long. Yeah, time. over a, like o almost a hundred years, yeah. maybe more. Actually, no, definitely more. Definitely, over yeah, definitely years. more. Huh? Yeah, and it's still being used today, which goes to show you what an effective weapon system that is. Very effective weapon yeah. system. Now, I think it's con is it considered an anti-material weapon? Yes, technically, so depending on what type of round you're using. Okay. So if you're using a uh, slap T rounds, that could definitely go through a lot of, a lot of steel. Yeah, a lot, a lot of, of steel, oil. and imagine like flesh. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like it's just like butter. You yeah. know what I mean? It's, it will destroy. Yeah. Destroy anything. It'll yeah. Do again. It's such a good suppress, like suppressive weapon system. That, like that's perfect for for anything like that. Yeah. Um. Anyway, so. I know it's easy to get like way off topic or not right. off topic, but it's easy to get sidetracked with that stuff. Cause I, I think that machine guns are such an important piece to the, the infantry in general, because providing suppression is like everything for like providing suppression for the maneuver element. You can't get the maneuver element on the objective without suppression. You can't, you can't do a lot of things without suppression, you know? Cause like if the enemy has anti-air weapons and you have CAS coming in, well, you need to suppress them for the CAS, right? You know, like we're like all kinds of scenarios for that. So, yeah, machine guns are a hugely important integral piece of the puzzle for the combined arms dilemma that we always aim to put the enemy in, you know? Yep. Um, so, all right. You got to the fleet. What was your first billet when you got to the fleet? My first billet, I was a uh, Mark 19 gunner. Mark 19 gunner? Yeah. That's, in my opinion, that's one of the hardest weapon systems to deal with because, like, we, especially with TP rounds, because, like, they're always misfiring with TP I rounds. I think it's the best way to train, actually. Yeah. When you have TP rounds, because when you go, when you get uh, a lot of misfires, that's what gets you to understand the weapon systems a lot more. You're probably right. Yes. So when you use TP rounds and you get misfires and you have to go through the procedures, yeah. it's kind of like, hey, now you got to put it to the test. Yeah. So now you understand, like, when you get live rounds and you do get those misfires, you're like, I've done this plenty of times. A million times, yeah. Really easy. Yeah, that's true. I mean, what is it that's the difference between, because like, for those of you that don't know, like the TP rounds misfire a whole lot more than the HDP rounds for whatever reason. It's just like a common thing. I don't know. I can't remember if it was because the diameter is a little bit smaller or something. You remember? There's a lot of things. So it's ma also made out of plastic too. Yeah. So the, the plastic, you know, plastic melts. Yeah, yeah. So that could mess up when it's going through the barrel. Yeah. It's uh. When you fire, when the gun gets too hot, you know, and also those little, the little links that comes on them. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're a lot more fragile than the ones you get. Yeah, they're a little janky. Yeah. A little more janky than like 50 cal yeah. links. So with those links, it hooks on to the round itself. And because it's plastic, it could pull, you could easily pull it off and unlink it from the round itself. Okay. So like when you're firing, it will like, some, the vibration from the gun will like, kind of yank on it and it will like de uh delink it from the round itself and never okay. cause misfire so okay. that's why you'll get and uh, with uh vice versa with you when you have an actual round it's not as janky it's like hooked on there it's not coming off okay so, it's a little bit more sturdy yeah. the links for the hedp round yeah you can't really pull that thing off okay with the hedp well, that's good yes. you don't want that <laughs> <No>. <laughs> that's real good cool all right well what's so you're in uh you're also in uh, the combined anti-armor team, yeah, correct? I am. Okay. So, and what's your what's your job right now? What's your bill? I'm a team leader for Cat Light. Okay. And a, what is a team leader? Is that you're not a vehicle commander? So it, essentially, it is a vehicle commander. Okay. But now you're just in charge of more vehicles. Cause Cat Light and uh, Cat Heavy is a different concept. Okay. So I roll around with uh, two Vicks, and I'm in control of those two vehicles. Oh, so you're in charge of both vehicles? Yes. Okay. I deploy those two vehicles. So you're a team leader for two vehicles yes. that you have your own two vehicle commanders for? Yes. Okay, so you'll have, do you so have a vehicle? I'll be the vehicle commander for one VIG. Gotcha. And then I have another secondary vehicle commander for that VIG. Okay. So in, in the case that I'm not there yeah. and I send him to go do something, he's in charge of that vehicle and then I'll be in charge of this vehicle. But like in 
the employment aspect, I'm in charge of uh, in charge of employing those two vehicles. Cool. Okay, that makes sense. Now, is is the vehicle commander for the other vehicle also a machine gunner? Yeah, it could be a machine gunner. It could be both, preferably, but uh, depending on so depending on the mission set. So if we have like uh, we're going against any type of armored vehicle and we want to take like a mall yeah. or a jav, then you put a fifty two. Okay. Uh, in charge of that vehicle. So it all depends on the mission set. Okay. Is that also what de- what determines which weapon system you're yes. going to have mounted yes. in that That's front a, truck? Yes. Okay. So all right, that makes sense. It, your loadout is all mission uh, or whatever the mission set is. Yeah. So that that determines what type of weapon systems you're taking out. Which so you're flexible. Yes. You're very flexible in cat light. That's good. So that's great. Yeah. Being flexible is important. Yes. Yeah. Especially in like an ever changing, ever evolving enemy situation. Yeah. Right. That. Like you start off, okay, the enemy's dismounted. Oh, well, the enemy situation got updated last night because we had some reconnaissance that went out and found out that they had some some BMP1s, mm-hmm. whatever. You know what I'm saying? Well, we got to bring these other things out then. That's important. Yeah, being flexible is important. All right, so you got how many guys total is, is in your team then? Six. Six dudes? So it's three per Vic. Three per Vic. Yeah. One gunner, one driver, one VC? Yeah. Okay. That's light. Yeah, that's, that's light. light. Yeah, cat light. I guess it makes sense why it's cat light. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, okay. that's cool, man. All right, so what do you, what do you guys do day to day? What's like day to day like for you guys? Uh, Lance Corporal Elder already hit on it. It's kind of so you would train to a standard. Yeah, you know, and whatever. Uh, so mostly we do TDGs, and okay. you would practice like employments of your weapon systems and like different mission sets and how you would load out for different mission sets and. How you get that? Uh, how you accomplish that mission? Okay. So, normally, what I do with my guys is I'll take them in to like the back, and we'll go into like the woods, and we'll like come up with a small little plan on, let's say we have a, a, a BTR seven or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And we're like, hey, let's go see what we could, how we would uh, employ weapon systems, and because we're we're not trying to get seen. So yeah, and hidden is like the most important part of it. Yeah. So we'll try to stay hidden as much as possible. And then we have 52s that are really good at hide sites. So that's why it's important for you to mix, you know, 52s and 31s. Yeah. So that everybody understands each other's job. Because now a 52 that knows how to make a good hide site, he could also make a hide site for, the, for a machine gun. So that's true. Yeah. You could just uh, mix, mix it around and you go and you will employ your weapon system to the best of your ability. Yeah. Cross training's huge, man. Yeah, yeah. Cross training's huge. That was one of the big things. So most of my seniors were machine gunners. Mm-hmm. We had like two fifty twos that were my seniors mm-hmm. or three, maybe most of them were machine gunners. So like we cross trained with them all the time. Like yeah. we were better at machine guns, honestly, than, than missiles. A lot of us, because we spent more time doing it. And it's also cheaper to shoot machine guns than it is to shoot missiles. So it's like a lot you're going to shoot more machine guns anyway. That's just the way it always ends up, which is cool because I love shooting belt-fed weapons. Like, I'm, I'm sure I don't know anyone who doesn't like shooting belt-fed weapons. It's you know the, what I'm saying? It's the best thing. Yeah, it's the best, best same thing. It's like just as good as going to the gym. You yeah. know what I'm saying? It's like it is a workout. Stress. It is a workout. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but especially if you hold like workout. a heavy weapon system right tightened down. You know what yeah. I'm saying? <laughs> it is but, a workout. Um. Okay, so you guys do a lot of TG, a lot of tactical decision games. You guys do a lot of cross training. Uh, do you guys go ever do the ISMIT ever? Yes, we do the ISMIT. What? Not, I can't remember what ISMIT stands for. I know what it means, but what does it stand? You remember what ISMIT stands for? It's like simulator training something. Uh, you guys remember what ISMIT stands for? What? I can't remember. It's like a. No. It's like an individual. It's like a simulator where you're like practicing yeah. firing weapon systems. If you if you don't have like the rounds on hand, and you're not in the field. You can go, yeah, you shooting the ISMIT or something. So yeah, what we do is when you when you get the time, because obviously you can't go to the field every day. Yeah, so yeah. Sometimes we'll uh, uh, get it set up where we take dudes to the ISMIT and they'll practice. Like a, they'll put out different scenarios out there. And yeah, yeah. They'll get behind the weapon system to, and they'll shoot it, and it's a real good like. Uh, baseline for them to understand like yeah. how to get their correct uh, shoulder pressure yeah and how to yeah shoulder pressure people don't understand what sh- it so people don't know what you mean by shoulder pressure shoulder like pressure. I, I think that's a really good idea to like go into what is shoulder pressure so 
with a machine gun, there's a lot of vibration that goes on and you have to kind of manhandle the gun or else it will manhandle you. You put your so. big meaty mitts on that thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so when you put the gun, you're, you're laying behind it and you put the gun in your shoulder, you want to push right tight and down. So when you're shooting, your cone of fire doesn't like, like it's not too wide and it doesn't spread out too much. So, cause those rounds are traveling they all have different trajectories and you're shooting like a hundred rounds per minute or 200 rounds per minute, depending on what type of weapon system you're using. So you want to be able to control those rounds as much as possible. So you need to push, uh, like, however, some people do right side and up. Some people do right side and down, yeah. but it's like the gunner's, um, gunner's preference gunner's kind of thing. Preference type yeah. of deal. And you don't want to have too much. Or you, you don't want to have too little because you can't sustain yourself if you have too much shoulder yeah. pressure. Yeah, you don't want to have too little because then the bullets will go all over. The place. Yeah, because it'd be jiggling all over. Yeah, yeah. Place. So, it's kind of, yeah. you know, but it's a good practice. It, it's as a machine gunner, that's like very important, especially yeah. if you're the gunner. That's one of the most important things. Yeah, because then you have a better beating zone. You know, when you get out there, yeah, yeah. That's that's the tough thing about machine guns is you gotta you gotta really you gotta put some. You got to put some energy into it for sure. You can't just like sit there and be lackadaisical and just pull the trigger. Like no. it's not not going to work out for you. Like, yeah, anyone can shoot a machine gun, but not everybody can shoot effective round, effective fires onto a target with a machine gun. So, so with the Mark 19, that's a good way for you to see people's shoulder pressure. Yeah, because when you shoot it, you could actually watch the rounds go down range, and then yeah. you could see. So, like. It will look like a snake if they have bad shoulder pressure. It'll, the rounds will kind of look like that going through the air. Yeah. Like, yeah, dude, you need to uh, fix your shoulder pressure. Yeah. Once they fix it, the rounds are just like right behind each other, and you'll see. So that's actually a really good weapon system to see dudes that have good shoulder pressure. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Now, do you guys um, do you guys practice a lot of like disassembly and assembly to familiarize guys with the weapon systems? I imagine you probably spend a lot of time at the armory. I know we we did. Yes. So like the basic stuff is the most important. Yeah. So like you harp on the basics because yeah. that's really what every what wherever you go, like advanced school, like all the always come back down to the basics. It's like the yeah. most important part of your job is being great at the basics yeah so, brilliance in the basics brilliance is huge the basics man is very huge yeah because if you can get good at all the basic stuff then you can start adding on to it yeah the advanced stuff doesn't matter if you're not good at the basics. yeah facts big facts um you went to your advanced school right i did where 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 did you go to your advanced school at camp guider oh here yes okay cool and how was how that how long was that it's uh six weeks six weeks long yes okay yeah, I don't know how it's. Is it still just called uh, AMGC? AMGC, yes. Okay, and um, eight weeks or six weeks? Six weeks. Six weeks long. What? 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 What's that like? What's that course like? So it's a lot of you get put into uh, different leadership positions. So if you're not used to being like a squad leader or section leader, yeah. And then for uh, the way how they're doing it now, it's like if you're a line company guy. They make you do cat. So, oh. and if you're a cat dude, they make you do line company. Nice. So there, it's actually a really good way for a really good way for line company dudes to see how because they could get put in cat when we go on deployment. So yeah, they get exposed to it throughout advanced school. True. And then, you know, you do you get fleet out. It's a field leadership evaluation where you just uh, they give you brief you an order and you have to come up with a plan and yeah. execute that plan and you'll kind of see. And they'll kind of grade you on your thought process, and they'll they they kind of push you in the in the right way of doing things, yeah, and have you become that much like better thinker, yeah, than uh than the average uh Lance Corporal or Corporal yeah, yeah, that's in the fleet. So they're trying to make sure you guys have like good bias for action. Yeah. You're able to come up and come up with a plan like yeah. out of your own head. Oh, like yeah, yeah. now how many how many guys do you do you have in your team or is it a squad? Are you like a squad leader usually for yes. this fleet? Usually a squad leader. So uh depending on how much dudes make it through the through, uh throughout the course. Okay, because so, like yeah, if people yeah. get dropped then yeah. your squad might start to shrink yeah. down. So I, we started off with around uh I think it was like eight dudes and we got down to like four five dudes, six Oh dudes. wow. Yeah. So it, it gets like Pretty so the attrition bad. rate is yeah. still is still a thing mm-hmm. for sure. Yep. Okay. What do you think people get dropped for the most? It's kind of 
I'll say, uh, it, the, it's, uh, is it tough to pinpoint one thing? Yeah, it, it's real tough to pinpoint one thing. Yeah. They get, you could get dropped for uh, failing tests and stuff like that, but yeah. it's mostly what people get dropped for is their leadership ability. Like okay. They're, they're like, you have to be a leader Yeah, in, when you go to advanced school. So well, We do a good job, I think, in the Marine Corps of of teaching people how to yeah. be leaders. Yeah. I, I, I like I've learned so much from that from everybody that I've been able to work around like like how to be a leader I didn't I didn't I thought I I thought I knew what what it meant to be a leader before I joined the Marine Corps nope not even close yeah, yeah. And, and and I think we do a really and I can't speak for the other branches I do, I do know that we expect more out of like lower ranks than other like say for example a lance corporal in the Marine Corps oftentimes has more responsibility than a specialist in the army who's like an E4 100. compared to an E3, you know? Um, and I think it's because we do a good job of teaching people how to be leaders at a lower level because they're they're expected to be able to perform the duties of the rank above them, mm -hmm. you know, which which that's, that's good. I think that's good that we do that. And you saw that kind of thing happening there is like people yeah. getting put in uncomfortable positions. Yes, you get put in real uncomfortable positions. So you have to be in charge of dudes. That's well, like sometimes you have sergeants that go to advanced school and you will be in charge of a sergeant. Yeah. So it's kind of is that weird? To, yeah, it's real weird because <laughs> now you're in charge of a sergeant and you're like, I'm telling you what to do and you have to listen to me. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of uncomfortable, it's kinda but it's, I mean, it is what it is. This man yeah. rules right now. Well, once you've been, uh, because once you've been doing it for, uh, once you go there and you start doing it for a while, you get used to it. So when yeah. you come back to the fleet, it's not really uncomfortable for you anymore. Yeah, it's probably much easier. You had a lot of practice. Much easier. Yeah. Were you? Did you? Do you feel like that when you came back from your advanced school, you were more confident in your ability to lead people? Yes, a hundred percent. Okay, a hundred percent. Because when you actually brief an order and you go execute it. It built it boosts your confidence through the roof. Hell yeah! Yes, especially when it worked. Yes, when it especially worked. when a plan goes smooth. When it goes smooth and you control your dudes how you want them to do stuff. Yeah, in the way that you want them to do it. And when you go out there and you execute it and you come back and you're like, that felt good. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, I when you come back to the fleet and uh, your platoon commander gives you a task, you're like, I got this. Yeah. Because I've done it. You know, so it's not, it, it boosts your confidence yeah. a lot and it makes you a lot better of a leader. That's cool, man. I think, yeah, the confidence piece is important too. It is very Like having, con cause like, you know, confidence, confident leaders inspires people to want to follow them more. Yes. You know, and like you want people like that leading your dudes, leading your dudettes, whatever it is, you know what I mean? Like. And, uh, I think there's, there's real benefit when you get to a place where everybody is confident. Mm -hmm. Like when you can count, when you can look down, look at every single person in the room and you're like, everyone here knows what the hell's going on right now. And I could trust any one of these dudes to do my job if I went down yeah. like that is that fill that, that would then fill the leader like, or the the staff sergeant or the lieutenant or whatever fills them with confidence because they're like, my guys know what they're doing. I can trust them. Yes. I don't have to like be here all the time. I know they know what they're doing. Yes. So that's what, that's one of the things that advanced, uh, one of the things that advanced school, uh, does for you too. It puts you in a position to where you understand yeah. like steps above you, like two steps above you. Yeah. They're actual, like you would be in their position and yeah. you'll be, controlling uh so if you're a sergeant you you'll be a uh, platoon commander right so you would be in charge of a platoon so it's like you're you're now seeing what a platoon commander has to do and yeah you know, so when you come back to the fleet you already understand what he has to do so you kind of take the what the weight off his shoulder because you already know because you're on the same wave same like wave. yeah you guys are like reading each other's yeah. thoughts and stuff yeah no I, that's that's cool that's that's the way it should be man yes. you know it's like a t it's a team at the end of the day it's yeah. a team like yeah, they may be a lieutenant or they may be a staff sergeant, but at the end of the day, like if one if one person fails, we all fail. Like the weakest link is like we are only as good as our weakest link, link. right? Yep. That's why you want everybody to be better. It's like yep. when Joe Rogan says on his podcast, the only way to make 
the country better is to have less losers. Well, if you make everyone into a winner in your team, well, your team's going to be pretty damn good after a while. You know what I'm saying? Like, like I love that. I think that's great. So what, um, what's it like for you guys in the field? Is it like, are you doing a lot of dismounted, a lot of mounted? Are you still doing like a lot of the stuff that you were talking about that you would do here in the rear? We do both. Do in both? the field, you do a, a mounted and dismounted. Okay. So good mix. Yes, a good mix. You get a fair share out of it, but it's it's mostly I could say it's most mostly on the mounted side because that's what we do. Yeah, because you got heavy guns, heavy guns, and we got uh, our JLTVs, and it's actually really important for us to stay inside of the trucks and shoot in from the trucks because it's a different a ball game when you're shooting from a truck and when you're shooting from a tripod. Yes. So it's a very it's a big difference. Yeah. So like on a truck, when you have when you're up there. The little when you turn your turret, you one of those uh the little I don't know what they're called, but so the pedal? The, no, it's not the pedal. Inside it rotates. It, Are you talking about the turret that rotates itself? Yes. So yeah. it has plays in it, and like every time it moves. Oh bit, yeah, it kind of yeah. can. Even if you so, lock it down, it can still it wiggle down, a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. When, one of the when it moves just a little bit, that's twenty mils a play. Yeah, inside of it, that makes a and big difference move, when you're shooting long distance. Roughly like sixty to a hundred mi- uh, mils, because yeah, it's a lot. You st- even though you lock it down, you still have play inside your turret. So you, those things you got to take into considerations when you're on a truck, yeah. rather than when you're on a tripod. You lock it down. Only thing you gotta worry about is just your shoulder pressure. Yeah. So it's very important for us to practice from our trucks. Yeah. And also, obviously, from the dismounted aspects. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, I've I've uh I got appreciation for both, and I see I see purpose and use for like usefulness for both based on the situation, right? Yeah. Um. Obviously, different situations are gonna dictate different responses. Um. But I think being cross trained between doing dismounted stuff and doing mounted stuff is super beneficial for everybody, especially if like you're coming from a line company, like you were talking about, some of the machine gunners might go from a line company to, okay. to cat. That happened to us a lot too. Mm-hmm. Same exact thing. Like we may, we, we, maybe we didn't get as many new join machine gunners as we needed to be at TO that year. So they're like, Hey, we're going to pull a couple guys from the line company. And then they came to us and, and usually they do pretty well because like they're, they're hardworking dudes cause they're running and gunning, you know what I mean? So they're ready to hop in trucks and just adapt to that challenge and face, face new obstacles and find a way over it and stuff like that. So, um, you know, guys are, guys are pretty good, pretty flexible from what I've seen when it comes to that kind of stuff. I've also seen it where we had machine gunners go from cat to the line company, yeah. which is, which is equally as difficult to adapt to because it's a different it's a different lifestyle yeah that's uh it's they both have like i would say going from line to a cat will be a lot more difficult because now yeah in when you're a line you just have a the m240 yeah Th- that's the only thing you have to worry about that's true so now when you're in cat you have your 50 cal your mark 19 and yeah. 240 so when you come to cat and you're just a line company dude now you have to relearn the mark 19 and the 50 cal which yeah. is like the like some of the most complex weapon systems in the, I would say in cat and yeah, it, except for the, like the saber and the jav, but like you need to know those weapon systems in order to even go behind them. So yeah, it's kind of a big uh, jump when you come from a line to cat. Yeah, a lot of dudes, I uh, they probably forgot how to use them. Well, you know what's funny is a lot of the guys that were in line companies that were getting ready to go to their advanced school mm-hmm. would come over oh, to Cat yeah. to be like, "Hey, bro, can you teach <laughs> me? Can you reteach me this stuff? I haven't done this since ITB. Like, yeah, I need to relearn it." Yeah, that's uh, that's usually what happens. I'm sure. So yeah, that's the same same thing, man. And yeah, that's that's cool though. I mean, they, you guys help each other out because it's a community. Like we're all family. Let's yep. like let's make e- let's help each other win. You know. Yeah, uh, now what we're doing mostly is we're cross training. So we'll yeah. take our heavy guns over there and we'll train the line company dudes okay. and vice versa. They'll come over here and show us how they do their their type of stuff. Oh, so how they run their support by fires. Okay. How they uh how they uh they would run uh an attack by fire. So Yeah. Uh, with our weapon system. So we'll go over there and we'll show them, hey, this is how we employ our weapon systems and they'll come in and be like, Hey, this is how we do it. It's uh for for pe- for people that don't know, let's touch on that real quick. Uh, what is what is the difference between a support by fire and an attack by fire? So with a support by fire, you have a maneuver element. Okay. Someone is going to uh, to an objective. You have to get them to an objective. 
that's in a support by fire because you're supporting someone. Yeah. With an attack by fire, there's no maneuver element. There's no one going to the objective. You're just there to destroy whatever target there is and yeah. leave. So th that's the major difference that you have between a support by fire and attack by fire. Attack by fire, just there to destroy it. Key difference. Key difference. Yeah. Yeah. Especially when you're like learning about the orders process and figuring out, hey, what's your mission? Yeah. You know, what's my mission? Well, you know, we could be doing a support by fire and like that means, okay, I need to know where the maneuver element is. But if it's attack by fire, it's like, I don't need to know where anyone is. We're just like, you know, we're going to just blast. We're going to start blasting is what we're doing. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah, cool. Well, hey, you know, I'm hoping that this will provide some like perspective and maybe pique somebody's interest and also just build, you know, build some esprit de corps within the machine gunner community because there's mm -hmm. not, I mean, when you think about the grand scheme of things, there's not a lot of machine gunners across the world. Like there's no, a very, it's, it's really a small not. community, man, you know, yeah, and we're getting smaller. Yeah, exactly. So like, it, I think it's important that people understand what it is a machine gunner is and what they do and the complexities of it, because it seems like, oh, yeah, you just run up to a gun and shoot fully automatic weapons. But that's not, there's so much that goes into it that yeah, people don't understand. There's a lot that goes into that. Yeah. So, but, you know, I think I think that people will, will gain benefit from your personal experience and you sharing your insight and um, and just, like, gain a better understanding of what, what it means to be a, an, an 0331 in the Marine Corps yeah. today. You know, because it's it was probably different three four years ago. It's probably going to be different in three four years from now. You know, yeah. um, and then of course every unit probably does things differently, and their cat platoons are different, and like the line platoons sometimes do things differently because they put their own flavor on thing on things. But um, either way, I appreciate you taking the time today to appreciate you for having me. Yeah, appreciate. I appreciate. I think this is great. This is good stuff. Like people are going to love this this type of thing. So. Um, yeah, again, I appreciate it and uh hopefully hopefully some people learn something. That's that's the end of the day. I told, hopefully somebody learned something, you know? Yeah. So but uh yeah, thanks again, man, and we'll Thank we'll, you. we'll see you around here in the future. All right, appreciate All right, it. Cool. Thank you.